grab me. I mean, if they say if you can lead, you know, um, it's a sign of really quality style. Uh, Self-awareness is a supreme gift, a treasure as precious as life. This is what makes us human, but it comes with a costly price, the wound of mortality. Our existence is forever shadowed by the knowledge that we will grow, blossom, and inevitably diminish and die. I, mean, I like the cadence of that. I like the rhythm of that. I mean, that's, and it's also right to the point of, in the heart of what you're writing about <laughs> here. You. And let's talk about what you're writing about here. It's sort of like uh, Hemingway said, all stories end in death. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm writing about, I've deliberately chosen the title uh, of the terror of death rather than the anxiety of death. You know, I think anxiety about death is just hardwired into us and we're going to be dealing with that always but uh, I, I'm talking about uh, people who are who live in terror and and the book is informed by a lot of people I've worked with for whom death became such a terror that it obsessed them uh, took over their lives uh, so I'm, I'm looking at uh, how I deal with with terror of death uh, and um, looking at how people have dealt with it through the centuries. It's been the topic of many great philosophers. It certainly has, and as you say, is at the heart of most religions, really, as well. But it's not only death terror. It's I death, think it's, it's the mother of all religions. I thought death is the mother of beauty, at yeah. least according to Wallace Stevens. So. <laughs> but that, actually, I, I can't, I'm thinking about that paradox in reading your book, because it is the sense of death and the awareness of death that you say can save us. But what do you mean by save? Redemption? No, no not, not, not save us in that way but I think save us in a way of living our lives in a in a richer and more vibrant way you know meditation upon death has been we've been heard that counsel for for centuries but the idea of keeping death in mind rather than avoiding the sight of it uh, can really change our lives make us uh, value our lives make us uh, feel our days and hours more more poignantly and, and richer it can also cast a shadow though obviously it, it casts a shadow but if you look at the shadow uh, long enough, maybe you see the, the the brighter part of that. You know, there, there's the monks used to keep a, a skull in their in their cells during for many centuries just to remind them of uh, mortality. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Poor Yorick, I knew him well. Uh, <laughs> you talk about the the uh, awakening process, uh, awakening experience, and you give many grief at the loss of someone you care for, life-threatening illness, breakup of an intimate relationship, a major milestone like a birthday, cataclysmic trauma, children leaving home, loss of a job or a career change, retirement, move to a retirement home, or powerful dreams. All of these things can awaken us to our mortality. Right, exactly. You know, and that idea came up for me quite some time ago when I was uh, starting uh, starting to think about writing a book on, on an existential approach to therapy. I'm talking about 25 years ago now, and I, I wanted to start to educate myself for, clinically to work with patients who were dealing with this. And at that point, you know, in your everyday patient, I, I really couldn't find people who could talk about it. There was always so much evasion. Now, I know a great deal more about how to help people uncover these things, but at that point, I, I found difficulty, so I decided I'd work with a population of people who could not get it out of their minds. I started to work with people with metastatic cancer, with cancer which had spread, and in those days, uh, you know, there was really no no hope, so they were having to face death. And to my surprise at that point, I found I worked for years, a whole decade as a matter of fact with people, mostly uh, women with breast cancer and formed groups of them. And to my surprise, there was a, a substantial number of people, perhaps a third, maybe more, uh, who rather than become numbed with despair, uh, had an awakening. You know, they began to live their life more richly. They began to say, um, that they are reprioritizing, they're trivializing the trivia in life. Beginning, uh, to, when I've heard, I heard them say, "What a pity it is! I had to wait till now to learn how to live, or that I've grown wise as a result of this confrontation." For me, that was that was my awakening experience. Of this whole topic, in a way, and since then, I I built on that. You don't have to wait till you're faced with imminent death to have that kind of experience. Well, you're trying to wake up therapists here too. I mean, you say early on that they tend to avoid it for the most part. It's that taboo of death. Oh, I'm definitely trying to do that. And and many therapists will say, well, why are we talking about this? You know, it never comes up in my treatment with patients, but uh, I think it doesn't come up if you don't want to see it. Or it doesn't come up if you're really uncomfortable in dealing with the topic yourself. I think you really... 
as therapists, you have to deal with uh, with your own mortality and your own death anxiety. I can tell you an example of that. It, when I was uh, started my training, I was a Johns Hopkins psychiatric resident, entered a, a orthodox psychoanalysis, 700 hours, never came up, never talked about it. Uh, it was only later when I started working with patients who were facing cancer, I began to have an enormous amount of personal death anxiety and went back into treatment another time. Chose a therapist who I thought more familiar with this, with, with real May. So it does not come up ordinarily in courses of therapy. Therapists may avoid it, may not see it, or they may say to themselves or to the patient, well, you know, we can't do anything about this. Let's let's get on to something neurotic, something we can do something about. Although you do write about that orthodox psychoanalysis. I think the analyst's name was Olive Smith and reaching out to you in a uh, moment that was really oh, yes. a, very, a very special moment having to do with death, uh, which gets to another subject that you explore here. That is how much uh, therapists ought to self-disclose and how much they ought to reveal of themselves. But before we get into that uh, and other things that I want to talk with you about in this Book, which has a lot of richness in it. Um, what can therapists really do, and when do you separate death anxiety from death terror, or how? Well, you know, I think we offer two things. Uh, one of the things we can, there are ways to help diminish death anxiety, and we can go into those as we go, but there's a, another thing is that we can do a lot more than that. That's the other thing we were just talking about. We can help uh, use the the confrontation with death as as a as a fulcrum to to help people change and 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 grow a great deal more, so I I think both both of these steps are important, uh, but mainly uh, I think the first step is to be able to talk about it, let the patient voice all their concerns. It's there in therapy. It comes up uh, most uh, if you start looking at dream life nightmares are always uh, dreams of, of of naked death anxiety that sort of escaped its corral and uh, and I look for this I'm very interested in when nightmares appear are we still assuming that dreams are the or nightmares are the royal road to our unconscious or I, I believe that very very sincerely you know, you've read Dobson and the Harvard people uh, to talk about us just flushing our sure our sure and uh, you know Freud said that before in his uh, original book on the interpretation of dreams he looked at previous theories and that was certainly one of them well it's a way of getting rid of all the excretia from, Lots of from daily life yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think a better way of looking at it, yeah, there are events of everyday life in there. Uh, there are the sort of building stones for dreams, uh, but we, we use these to build the edifice and, and put other deeper meanings onto them. Why are we selecting these particular events rather than other events? Uh, they don't form the whole character of the dream. So I use dreams often in therapy. In fact, lately, uh, with the new age, you know, I have patients email me their dreams, so I have them in front of me when we talk. And uh, New age, you mean internet. You don't mean I'm new not, age like... No, no, no. <laughs> right. No, it definitely. Internet. <laughs> I'm talking with Irvin Yellow. His new book is Staring at the Sun, Overcoming the Terror of Death. Where, where do we uh, decide the Rubicon is between, again, terror and anxiety here? Well, um, it's when the anxiety is dis when when the concerns about death are disturbing our tranquility. When we can't get them out of our mind, I'll give you an example. A patient comes up to see me. She drove a couple of mile, a couple of uh, hours to see me. Had her father and an uncle in the car. A uh, beautiful day, looking at the scenery. But she says, you know. Uh, I keep thinking everything's going to pass. Uh, my uncle, my father, how, many, how long will I be able to see them? You know, they're going to disappear. The trees are all going to disappear. Everything's going to turn gray. It takes away my, my sense of beauty. Uh, it, it disrupts everything that I see. That's the kind of thing that I mean where death has really kind of uh, taken over the fear of oblivion, the fear of transiency. Uh, so it disturbs one's equanimity. So th that that's a good example. It's also uh, an example that seems to me really illustrative of what you want to get at in this book when you talk about, um, well, Pierre in War and Peace, mm -hmm. use a lot of literary references, but it's the same thing. I like the fact that you parenthetically added that this is what happened to Dostoevsky, literally. Oh, oh yes. You know, being I'm... ready to face the firing squad, you're getting ready to literally be shot to mm -hmm. and then suddenly saved. And the sense of awakening that that kind of close call with death. Anybody can tell those stories. Boy, I came with a close, such a close call that it awakened me in such a 
extraordinary way. Sure, sure. And I, I think I think it's always a mistake when you think of history of psychiatry, a history of psychotherapy starting in the 19th century. It really began with the great writers and the great thinkers. Uh, so I use, I, I mine the great novelists and the great philosophers. Uh, and I think these are, are really the forerunners of our field. So and the great thinkers. Uh, so I use, I, I mine the great novelists and the great philosophers, uh, and I think these are, are really the forerunners of our field. So Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, those are wonderful examples of awakening experience. And in the in the text I use, perhaps the most familiar literary one, which is, is Scrooge, Awakening and Christmas Carol. I just saw that again at the at the at Christmas time at ACT, and uh, you know Scrooge is a, is a wonderful example of this mean spirited old man everyone dislikes he dislikes everyone else, and by the end of the story, you know he's rich uh, he's generous uh, and loved, and and what changed him? You know it it really wasn't Christmas cheer. What changed him was that Dickens delivered a really powerful kind of existential therapy. He sent the angel of the future there, yanked him into the future, let him witness his death, let him witness people dismissing his death in a casual way. And in the very last scene before Scrooge's transformation, he's in the churchyard fingering his name, the letters of his name on his tombstone. Next scene, he's a changed man. That's a beautiful example for me of an awakening experience. I thought of one, too, in reading your book. A friend of mine who died a couple of years ago, who was, we used to joke about how lugubrious he was. He seemed to carry sorrow with him all the time mm. and was dying and knew he was dying and was literally on his deathbed and he had his children around him and his grandchildren around him. And suddenly I saw a euphoria there mm. that I, an intensity and a passionate sense of, well, you call it rippling, I mm -hmm. guess. I mean, rippling is a good word. Yeah. Let's talk about that. What is that? Well, well I'm, I'm looking at the various ways we can help attenuate, help up lessen our fears of oblivion and death anxiety. And, and I, I, I like the idea of rippling. And by that, I mean, just think of throwing a stone in a, in, a, in a pond and you get these ripples going on and on and on. And I think it's that way for us. Our personal identity won't be extended, but some part of us, some act of virtue, some aspect, some trait uh, ripples on and on and on and influences others who may not know us, but we we persist in that way. I went to a memorial of uh, a very close friend who, who died, and the memorial was just a, uh, a few days ago. This is Diane Middlebrook, who may well have been on your show at other times. She was time. a friend of mine as well. Yes, and uh, there was an example where someone talked about her stride, and she said that she had this wide, confident stride, and the person speaking was a student of hers and said that she had learned it from her and used her as she walked across the, uh, the at Stanford campus. Now she says her daughter, who's now a sophomore in college, seems to march this way all on her, on her own and, and will pass it on to others. So parts of Diane... Uh, without even their knowing that it's Diane, get passed on and on and on. Uh, it happens very often, for example, with school teachers. It happens for therapists. You know, it, it happens for parents. Uh, so I, I I like the idea of rippling, and it's a way of keeping in mind that that uh, that a passage is not the same as as oblivion. But you also remind us we die alone. You also remind us that our memories die with us mm -hmm. and that the sense of, of all of those memories that are only ours, that have you know, our individual identity stamped on them, are gone. And there's a difficulty sometimes in not really facing that kind of ephemerality because it's it can be overwhelming. Yeah, that's something. I have a quote in here somewhere by Kundera who talks about that we have a taste of death and simply forgetting because... One aspect, you know, if you ask people a question, and I do ask people this who are dealing with that issue, it's, I, I have to, I have to almost start off by apologizing. Listen, I'm going to ask you a very simple, stupid question, but what is there about death? What, in particular, most concerns you, most frightens you? And people will answer in very different ways. Uh, and one of the ways they'll talk about uh, that some people will talk about is the idea that their own personal world will disappear. There is a world that you have constituted, you've constructed all the precious memories and. Uh, 
sensations that you've had in your life, they really only belong to you, and that world's going to go forever. You know, we've each, we've each constituted our own lives in our own world, and it's different from anyone else's constitution of the world. That goes too, and that's, for some people, that's a very painful part of, 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 of oblivion, of dying. It's, it is for me. I, I have a, a great sensation of that. Well, you try to capture some of those memories in here. In fact, uh, your cat and the first time you encountered death of the kid in yeah. second or third grade. Irving Yalom is our guest. His book is Staring at the Sun, Overcoming the Terror of Death. Kichel, we even have, you know, <laughs> these kinds of things that just flow out of memory, uh, or certainly have flowed out of your memory. Um, you mentioned E. Cummings' uh, poem, uh, Buffalo Bill, where he says, you know, Mr. Death. It suddenly occurred to me, death is always in a male figure, isn't it? Never comes to us as a female figure. Fate comes to us as a female figure, but not death. Yeah, the the Grim Reaper, uh, maybe in some guy with a scythe. Uh, yeah, um, yes, he is. A, he is a male figure. Uh, uh, I think maybe in in some Hindu some Hindu myths, maybe death might be a female, but but usually it's a it's a male figure. Yeah. Well, so is God, of course. And you uh, well, you yeah. go you go into this existential uh, philosophy of yours here, and it doesn't include God. It doesn't include religion. Uh, and to some of your patients, uh, religion and God are a great deal of comfort, a great source of comfort. Sure. Yeah, that's a, it's an important issue. You know, I, I'm, I'm writing about death, and I'm defining death in an existential way, that we're finite, that we're mortal, that death is the end. And I'm, I'm uh, therefore, by definition, excluding other views of death, which de-deathifies death with saying, oh, it's not an end. You know, it may be the beginning. It may be the, the, uh, the doorway to another kind of life. So, uh, uh, so I'm, by definition, I'm not talking about those, but, but I, I have to, I have to answer and talk about your comment about religion because that's so important because my priorities as a therapist say, uh, there, there's one priority which is uh, supersedes all others, which is caring for the patient. If, if if one of my patients is gets comfort from religious views, gets comfort from a idea of the afterlife, uh, I, it would be unthinkable for me to try to challenge that or try to remove something that gives them comfort. And I give some examples of this in the book. In fact, I go in the other direction. I work with a priest who and for uh, most of his uh, adult life has gotten a great deal of comfort from 5 a.m. conversations with Jesus and become so uh, oppressed with issues going on in his in his parish that he has stopped doing that. Well, my, my tendency is to take a look at why is he depriving himself of that comfort. Uh, so I'm interested by and large, uh, first of all, in the, in the comfort and the well-being of the patient, not my own ideological beliefs. But this book is clearly written in, in a secular existential mode and I'm taking, uh, making the basic assumption that we are thrown into this world alone, we'll, we'll leave it alone, that we're mortal, there's no afterlife, and we can't be threatened or harmed by anything in the afterlife, which can be for many important source of comfort. What do you do with the notion that uh, some who follow your line of thinking are more prone to transgressive behavior because there is nothing to keep them from that transgressive behavior and that could be indeed a way of trying to defy Mr. Death. Transgressive behavior, aggressive behavior you mean. Or transgressive. Should, I said, some, you can use, well, you know, one. I think that's in in the uh, that's uh, sort of the old Dostoevskian uh, argument in the Brothers Karamazov. The idea, well, if there's no God, then anything anything, is permissible. Anything's so, permissible. Was, yeah. Anything's permissible. Right. But I don't think that's true. You know, I think it's a I think it's a myth that religion is the uh, is the uh, mother of morality. And um, you know, it's certainly an issue that in my my previous book novel uh, on Schopenhauer. That's an issue he uh, he really uh, tried to make that 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 religion is not the mother of morality. There are many sources of morality. In fact, if we look at what's happening in the world today. Uh, we see uh, religious conviction and strife and, and uh, as a source of a great deal of discord and, and pain in our world. Uh, I think there are, I think a, a confrontation with death, a real confrontation of that is, it also leads to a sense, as it did, for example, in, 
and even Ilyich, leads to a strong sense of compassion with all others. The idea that everyone is in this together, uh, that we're, there's a certain kind of linkage that we have between us. We're all facing, and this goes for therapists as well, we're all facing this together, we're fellow travelers, and leads to a great sense of, of compassion to others rather than to aggressivity. And human connectedness, I think, is the other human side of this that you, that you right. point out, uh, which leads me back to the old idea, the idea of self-disclosure for the therapist. Again, this is a way of bringing forth his or her humanity, and this is something that, well, you champion, really. I, 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 do. I do. I do feel that, that the very cornerstone of a therapeutic relationship is, is authenticity. And that means to recognize that you too have these kinds of issues, and um, and the, that you're 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 in a sense fellow fellow travelers, and a certain amount of of, of, of self revelation is is essential. I think you see that for the first time in a in a mass media in this this new show on on called in treatment, uh, where the therapist there is 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 quite human and quite revealing. I like that. I like the way that he's presented in the first few versions of that show. I was a little skeptical of that show, but you know, I've gotten into it, and I think it, has, it actually presents things pretty well. Yeah. And, and Gabriel Byrne is a fine actor. I mean, he's doing. Uh, because I keep thinking, I keep comparing him to Dr. Malfi, uh, Lorraine Bracco in The Sopranos. And oh, I can't yeah. help it. It's a different kind of representation. Well, I, I disliked her view of therapy very much. And it was, there was something extremely inauthentic about that. Uh, television and, and mass media has not done well with psychotherapists. The only one that I've, I've enjoyed before this show was Robin Williams and Goodwill Hunting. There's a therapist I would have been glad to visit as a patient. Well, because he was compassionate and loving. Really. That's right. Exactly. And real. Son overcoming the terror of death, and he'll be at Kepler's Wednesday night in San Francisco at 7 p.m. He's with us now. We're going to go to your calls, and let's do that right away. Marv, good morning. Morning. Yes, sir, you're on the air. Uh, I would like the doctor to comment on uh, the movie 2001, because uh, I don't see that movie as a, uh, a futuristic kind of space travel movie. I see it as a, a commentary on um, birth and death. If you uh, look at it uh, from its beginning to its end, it's uh, uh, that's what the way I see it. This is Kubrick's film. I didn't know we were doing uh, film analysis. So you don't know the film. Right? Oh, well, I, I, I saw the film, but I, I don't remember it well enough to think of it. Tell me a little bit more about what you had in mind about the film that, that pertains to this topic. Uh, it was, Good therapist it, it, question. Yeah. It was a wonderful picture, uh, film, but I don't remember how does it relate here. Well, the movie starts out as in the, at the beginning of time and yes. the beginning of humanity, and then it ends up with a uh, futuristic space travel and the man, the hero of the uh, movie, lying on a bed uh, as a very, very, very old man, and obviously going through the throes of death, uh, and. Uh, uh, his, even though no words are spoken in that, those final scenes, he knocks a glass of wine off the table and stares at the broken glass on the table, on the floor. And then he, um, uh, his, the next scene, he's seen lying in bed. And then the final scene, he's um, uh, going off through space, uh, but back in the womb. Uh, it's a picture of a of a, uh, a child in a womb uh, in its uh, initial stages of development. So let me just tell you a couple of free associations I have to that. You know, uh, you know, and of course the picture does end with uh, with the whole issue of of a new kind of uh, shall we call it life? You know, with the with the robot beginning to the artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence beginning to take over. And of course that's been a theme of a, of a, of a light of, a lot of uh, of science fiction. The, the Hyperion kind of trilogy really does illustrate that as well. The other thing you're talking about is about which is very interesting point that you're making about the going back to the wound. I, this is a little bit of a loose association, but let me tell you about something I wrote about, which is a very, very old argument going back to 350 BC. It's one of Epicurus's uh, major arguments as a way. He felt, Epicurus was a Greek philosopher who felt that that the, the job of philosophy was to, uh, to alleviate the despair of human beings, and all despair, he felt, uh, issued 
uh, issued from the fear of death. And one of the arguments he's given, and it is still current, I use it in therapy very often, is the idea that, um, that, that when we pass on, when we move into, if we can call this a state of non-being, we, and we, there is, it's really identical to the state of non-being we were in before the womb, before our, birth. But only it, Beckett remembers being in the womb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Actually, right. here, here's an email that kind of uh, dovetails. Uh, Dr. Yalom, death anxiety often arises in therapy sessions with my clients and usually in the form of visceral experiences of existential nothingness and emptiness. I welcome it and often find the deepest, most transformative work happens in the presence of discovery of emptiness. And she goes on to say, you've been a source of great wisdom for me as a therapist. So right. there's, there's your existential hook in a way. I mean, when you discover this emptiness, when you know you're up at the top of the mountain like Sisyphus, and right. you have that moment of clarity or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. When you when you really do sense one of the existential tenets really is that you're, you're thrown, is Heidegger's term, you're thrown alone into the world and you have to exit alone and you can't take anyone with you either. There is a certain kind of isolation, which is, I think of as existential isolation. It's not the typical form of isolation we talk about, which is cured by social interaction. It's, it's something that, that undercuts that isolation that, that can't be bridged. You know, one of my patients that Can I... Can you go back to Heidegger for just a moment? Sure. Because you, you make the, the, the... I don't want to get too much into Heidegger here. Yeah. Uh, not, yeah, let's not see that he was. But <laughs> no, you make the distinction between the every... He makes the distinction between the everyday and the ontological, and you point out that distinction as, as an important one for us to understand. Yeah, it's something that is, is a very important concept. To put it in uh, I think the the most graphic terms he he makes a distinction between every two states of being there's the everydayness state of being in which we're preoccupied with things around us we're distracted by things but then every once in a while and we wonder about how things are in the world in other words how things are about us the nature of things but there's another state of being he calls this ontological state of being ontological simply means the study of being but it's a state of being in which we wonder and marvel that things are rather than how things are. You see the difference? How, sort of that like there are the, things at all, that, that things exist at all in the universe. It's like I it nigh thou in a way. Isn't That's it? right. Oh. Yeah, I think it is. And, and so when we get into the state of that things are, we're in a state of mind where we're thinking more deeply about existence itself. And what's really important for, for therapists in that, if when people are in that state of mind, then they're much more apt and prone to make changes. That was the state of mind that I talked about that some of my patients with cancer got into. And so they began to uh, trivialize all these trivia around them. One person told me that, that cancer cures psychoneurosis, you know, that... Uh, that uh, the changes can be made then that are very rapid. So my job as a therapist is how do we propel one from that state of everydayness to that state of mindfulness of being itself? And that's why I take advantage of things like dreams or brief encounters with death. And very importantly also, the death of others. You know, we know a lot about grief and mourning, and we know a lot about loss and detaching ourselves gradually from the lost one so that we can begin to use our energies to begin to make new attachments. But there's an important part of mourning that we often overlook, which is that the death of the other brings us into confrontation with our own death. So I think when I work with people who are in grief, I try to take a look at the, this new encounter they have with with their own death. All of this is a way of moving into what you're talking about of Heidegger's state, of, uh, of the ontological state, of awareness of being. Bonnie, join us. You're on the air on Forum. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Go ahead. Great, great. Um, yes, I'm fascinated by this conversation. I read Stephen Levine's book 10 years ago, A Year to Live, and was so inspired by it that I started a group um, of all women at that time to really look at living with death as a guide. Since then, I've led 50-something groups through a year-long process, and um, I've also give day-long workshops called Living Mindfully Now. Uh, two months ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and who does it put it right up front? Um, the, the, 
the gift of living, like for one, for a while, I lived with a glow-in-the-dark skeleton skull in my bedroom to remind me if I woke up in the middle of the night that I was going to die. So having 10 years practice of really looking at this just gets me closer to the wow. It makes life. every night Halloween, actually, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but um, this this death being close without ever calling it to us, you know, brings up every friendship I've had, everything that 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 needs cleaning up, and just has me lets me to be more free. And right in the middle of medical treatment, um, it keeps letting me come back to that place that you mentioned before of of being. That right now I'm alive. Right now I'm here. Right now I'm. Happy. You mentioned the mindfulness here, and of course, yes. I often associate that with Buddhism uh, too. Um, I mean, as a practice. Uh, yes. Irv Yalom, uh, how important is it to keep death in our minds? I mean, particularly for people who aren't necessarily experiencing the terror of it uh, or plagued by the terror of it. Well, we can't stay in that white heat all the time, but I think as a background. Um, I mean, as a practice. Uh, yes. Irv Yalom, uh, how important is it to keep death? in our minds, I mean, particularly for people who aren't necessarily experiencing the terror of it uh, or plagued by the terror of it. Well, we can't stay in that white heat all the time, but I think as a background, uh, the uh, the willingness to look at it in the same way this caller, uh, is it, Bonnie, is it? Bonnie. About Bonnie. You know, I'm, I want to ask you something, Bonnie. Have you been uh, able to continue your therapy practice with, with your clients during this time? I'm not a therapist. Oh, I actually, I actually teach mindfulness. Oh, so, but these groups you're leading then are well. You're let's not call them therapy groups, but I assume that they are therapeutic groups. Yes, they're deeply therapeutic, and yes, I, I actually had to deeply consider whether I would start new groups. Um, and yes, I have. I continue to lead six groups through this year year long process. You know it it brings me even closer. Well, that's that. I'm really interested in hearing that. I mean, that's an extremely courageous uh, thing to do uh, to, to to sort of use your own uh, your own pain and your own new awareness to really pass this on to others. And in an indirect way, of course, by offering others a sense of meaning, you you imbue your own life with meaning. Uh, you know, I've looked at some therapists. I know therapists who, the instant that they've gotten uh, the diagnosis, stop their practice the next day. And I've known other therapists, uh, and I, I talked about one of them in my book, The Schopenhauer Cure, a therapist who had a fatal diagnosis, but he decided, how did he want to spend the rest of the last year of his life? And he thought he liked the way he was living. He felt it was deeply imbued with meaning, so he practiced until the very end. And I think that's that's a, a, a choice that perhaps you're making as well. I uh, am. I applaud it. It's, it's uh, wonderful think, to hear that. Let me thank Bonnie for the call. And uh, we'll go to Memphis, Tennessee next and welcome Jacob onto the air here. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Um, basically, I was uh, listening to your program and it occurred to me about how many people uh, have feared death because of their dogma. Uh, what they will fear at the end of their life when they actually have to face death. Uh, I guess uh, certain dogmas apply a certain level of fear within a person of what they have to answer to at the end of their life. And uh, I think that that's a big hang-up in uh, a lot of cultures as far as facing death. Uh, just the fear of not basically dying of what they will have to answer to at the end. You know, that was, uh, I think that's a really important question. Maybe that was a little bit more relevant and more important in past centuries when there was so much fear of of, uh, of the afterlife and, and death and hell. You know, it, it, and it, when I talked earlier about Epicurus, that was that was one of his first arguments. His first argument is was based on the fact that there were so many religious leaders at that time who were gaining power by frightening their congregation about what was going to happen to them after death. So he started his arguments about death anxiety for de uh, to uh, ameliorate death anxiety by saying, first principle is we are mortal. We have no afterlife, and therefore, we have we have no fears. 
we can have no fears about what will happen to us. The gods, if there are gods, you know, cannot harm us in the afterlife. He believed that there were gods, but they were somewhat oblivious of our life. And the way he felt that we could learn from gods was to view them as a model for bliss and tranquility, how we could how we could increase our virtue and live a life of bliss, or as he termed it, ataraxia, uh, forever. So yes, I think your point is very well taken. Just drink the nectar, right? Like the gods did up on Olympus. Uh, yep. Here's a listener who says, I have experienced death anxiety as early as I can remember, certainly at least since I was about four or five when I first started my awareness of my own mortality. I experienced severe bouts of death anxiety right before I fall asleep but only rarely during the daytime. Is there an explanation for this? Well, you write in your book about sweet Morpheus and how close sleep is to death. I mean, it's probably the closest we can have true cognition of death. That's right. The Greeks had uh, two of their two of their figures, uh, Hypnos and Thanatos. Uh, sleep and death uh, were 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 twin were twins. It may be the closest we can get to a certain kind of. Uh, 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 awareness of mortality. But the, the other point you're making, I, I want to say just a thing or two about that. I do go into that a, a good deal in, in staring at the sun. You know, the idea that the, there is a kind of developmental, life development of, of awareness of death. And I think your, your comment about being, uh, being aware of it quite early in life, I, I, I find that is very true for great number of people that death awareness starts at an earlier age than most adults imagine you go back to your own life we become aware of death when we see evidences of it see evidences of it in dead insects falling dead leaves and then of course then dead pets which is often a great shock and then the death of a grandparent or maybe an early attendance at a funeral uh, and then it sort of goes underground maybe after the age of six or seven you know Freud talked about the great uh, sexual latency where all of our uh, infantile sexuality goes underground for a number of years. Well, I think the same thing happens uh, with awareness of death, and it reemerges again for many of us uh, in, in adolescence. So adolescents are acutely aware of death, and one of the ways they cope with it, I think, is uh, we can use a professional term maybe counterphobically, which is, in other words, they go into the face of it. They go to horror films and have a fascination with horror films, or they talk. Or they court the, it rebelliously in the, many instances, that's right. too. Daredevilry. They take chances with it. And then when the two major tasks of adulthood begin to settle in, which is forming your family, raising your family, and pursuing your career, I think then death again goes underground for a long time, 20 years or so, and reemerges again in what we often think of as the midlife crisis in their 40s and 50s. And from that point on, I think we're perhaps never entirely free of it. Couldn't help thinking, though, with that listener bringing up sleep and, you know, um, there's a wonderful novel by Henry Roth called Call It Sleep, which you may know. I do um, know. And the mother, who's a very loving figure in the novel, says to the son, you know, you might as well call it sleep, trying to explain what death is. Right. Uh, it's just a sleep. It's, yeah. you know, it's a uh, Raymond Chandler type of sleep, too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's how we understand it, and yet we really don't understand it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's just so many things that are impenetrably mysterious about it. Yeah. And we'll go to Alamo. Ruth, you're on. Hi. Okay, hi. This is Ruth Nathan. Thanks. I love Forum. I just wanted to call in. I'm 62 years old. I'm a grandmother. And um, when the doctor talked about moving into that state of mindfulness of being, right away my ears perked up. Um, within a couple of years, my husband and I, one, I was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, and my husband had open heart surgery. I'm actually taking care of my grandchildren now. Yeah, we are. But I just wanted to say that having... Um, I'm the editor, uh, well, maybe I mentioned that already, of Grand Magazine, the child development editor, and I can't tell you how the, that diagnosis, both for my husband and myself, affected our relationship with our grandchildren. I thought perhaps maybe you'd want to talk a little bit about this, but you, you just talked about into the face of it, getting into the face of it. Well, you can get, there are lots of ways of approaching that, and one is, I think, thinking about your grandchildren and what you do on a daily basis with them as an approach to thinking about into the face of it. 
Does that make any sense? Yeah, this this is uh, this is exactly the point. I think it's a wonderful example, exactly the point that I was making, that I think, uh, you know, your diagnosis, your husband's illness moved you into this state of, of greater uh, awareness uh, of death and changed your life so that you began to put the, the important things really uh, gave them greater priority. So this is a wonderful example of, a, of, a, of an awakening experience. Uh, but we could also say that, yes, you, you got a diagnosis uh, at that point and your husband did as well. But in fact, you know, we don't need to wait for that diagnosis because if we are aware of it, we all have that diagnosis that we're mortal from the very beginning of our life. Uh, in 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 my book, I describe a, a short essay by Freud, written a long time ago. But he talked about taking a walk with the poet and a colleague, and the poet lamenting the fact uh, that what a tragedy it was that everything passes, that everything will turn to dust eventually. And Freud was making exactly the opposite point. He says, "No, you're wrong. It's exactly the opposite. The knowledge." that everything passes makes things more beautiful, makes things more in, invested with, with, poignan, with poignancy and preciousness. So the, you're, you're, you're coming uh, close to saying exactly the same thing I think he was saying in that wonderful essay. And thank you, Ruth. There's a listener who says, I've been a slowly worsening chronic pain patient for the past nine years. I've often gotten to the point of considering whether it would be better to be out of pain rather than continue this life. It has changed my attitude toward death as it will be a relief to me in the sense that my pain will stop. At the same time, there is no way I can leave my wife, children, extended family, and friends behind. Death as it will be a relief to me in the sense that my pain will stop. At the same time, there is no way I can leave my wife, children, extended family, and friends behind. A terrible Yes, it's, it's an awful story, and and chronic pain is just uh, is 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 one of the more most unfortunate things that happened to us, and it it does does changes our relationship to death. Though yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, when you're in that tunnel and you don't know if you're going to get out of it, I'm speaking personally here. You, you get the sense that. It would be a relief yeah. just to get out of it. Well, you know, let, let me just extend that just a little bit because there are some people that come to see us in therapy who have that sense. They have not, not, not chronic pain. It's a little different. But they have a lot of mental anguish. And they have the fantasy of suicide, of ending their life, and then they will be free of it. But there's an important point you have, to, you have to think because they have the fantasy that they were going to be in a state of existence free of this mental anguish. And that, of course, is the magical thinking that goes on. You have to help them understand that you're not going to be around to witness how you are without this kind of anguish. Uh, so that uh, non-existence is not existent. It's not a kind of existence where you suddenly are going to be free of pain. So I, I feel that one has to make the person aware of that as a, as a way of kind of uh, trying to, to deal and to prevent suicide. And we'll... Uh Move to more of your calls. Milton is next up. Morning. Hi, good morning, sir. Um, I just wanted to ask, I'm 23 myself, I'm a pretty young guy, um, and in fact, listening to your program, I pulled off a and kind of walk in the valley near uh, the Zampa Bridge in the Coquina Strait. It's really pretty out here. But I wanted to ask you, is there any impulse among young people that you've observed that kind of um, reflects this tension or anxiety about death? I mean, sort of like a, an impulse, I guess, to make a name for yourself, to kind of achieve immortality in that way. Oh yes, there's there's a, a, a daredevilry is one. I have a patient now who talked about uh, doing a lot of skydiving when he was sixteen or seventeen as a way of defeating that. But you know, we go back again to uh, I hate to keep working on this, but he, uh, I almost wrote a novel about Epicurus. That's why I'm so interested in him. I didn't do it, but but he the, says the Epicurus cure or <laughs> <laughs> the Epicurus cure, right? But then uh, he says, and it's true today that you know it's not that we have a lot of. Uh, many of us don't have a lot of ongoing conscious anxiety of de about death, but we construct our lives in such a way that we're dealing with it. We try to, we try to dedicate ourselves passionately to becoming rich, to becoming famous, to become well known, to get larger and larger and larger, to chisel our names on the uh, on the tablets of eternity. But in fact, all these are ways of kind of uh, 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 of escaping. The, the knowledge that we're mortal. And uh, so, you know, that we we don't live well because we're so obsessively concerned with, with greatness or with fame or with uh, with wealth. Uh, and so I, I, I think that these are indirect ways, as, as you're suggesting, of, of dealing with, with, with mortality. 
And we thank you, Milton, for the call. Uh, here's a listener who says, it's not death that I'm terrified of. It's dealing with the death of those close to me. It's enough to drive one to suicide because as one who does not believe in an afterlife, I feel they are just gone from my life and I will end alone and unremembered. I won't even have a pet. I guess that speaks for itself. Uh, he also talked about in the book, though, the... It's like the old Lenny Bruce bit, you know, the guy's in the in the ambulance and he's uh, uh, trying to grope uh, the woman who is the paramedic or whatever because things have become so intensified. In fact, you use that example not from Lenny Bruce but just mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. uh, heightens libido and sexuality certainly to face death and one's mortality or yes. can? Yes, that, that that is true. I think that uh, that sex... Uh, sexual uh, and libido is 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 a is a, is a source of a great deal of vitality, and I have often seen people who are grappling with death suddenly also get an infusion of erotic desire. This this story you're giving, I've heard it before from clients of becoming very sexually aroused, even in an ambulance, rushing them to to the hospital. Um, the the um, the the comment that you're making about your being unremembered, you know, if if I were working and talking to you i, I want to mention something else to you is uh, i i think it would help to take a good look at this whole concept of rippling of being unremembered but i i think you'll find uh, that you're passing other parts of yourself on to others that there are people you know who take pieces of you into them and if you feel that is not happening well this is a good time to start to help it happen it's a good time to reach out become more intimate become more uh, open with other other people with those about you are uh, there always going to be people in your life that you have contact with that you leave something of yourself even though not of, your identity onto others is there a danger though that it can be narcissistic and too self-involved you know you want to leave your imprint and you want to see rippling in other words because it's sort of like narcissist looking and seeing himself no, no I don't think so because I'm not I'm not thinking of passing on your personal identity I, I'm thinking of you're trying to live a life of of compassion and virtue, and and through that helping others to live life differently and changing them so that they will change others and you pass on this to to future generations. Let's go to Trish, our next caller. Good morning. Welcome to Forum. Oh hi, hi. I wanted to ask Dr. Yalom if he could uh, relate his current book topic to his love's executioner topic. I have in front of me Joseph Goldstein's book, uh, Loving Kindness, where he quotes you, Doctor, uh, that you don't like to work with patients who are in love because it's uh, maybe because of envy, you too crave enchantment, and. Um, that the good therapist fights darkness and seeks illumination while romantic love is sustained by mystery and crumbles upon inspection. And I, uh, Goldstein goes on to talk about a kind of love that is not falling in love but standing in love. And I guess that relates to my feeling of the only real anxiety I have about death that I that stays with me all the time is to make sure that I've lived and loved as well as I can. Yeah, these are well, are is wonderful questions that you're asking. The idea of of falling in love, uh, not falling in love, but standing in love is. I, I love that phrase. Incidentally, that's a phrase from Eric Fromm uh, in his book Art of Loving, which is remains an extremely wise book. But the point I think that you're alluding to too is that there are so many different forms of love, and the of falling in love, the idea of passionate, ecstatic love, where you've got a sudden crush on, on somebody else you're obsessed with. There is a kind of irrationality about that. Before I call it a form of insanity? Well, you, yes, you could fall, call it a form of benign insanity, I think. Sometimes it's not so benign. But what happens is you are imbuing that person with, with features and aspects that, in fact, really aren't there. And when you suddenly fall out of love, you're saying, well, what was I thinking? Uh, why had I elevated that person? And the other thing is you are giving that person so much power over you that if that person says something to you, you're elevated, that person uh, doesn't, that ignores you, you're suddenly in the depths of despair. It's, I think, very important that we, we begin to get the center of our own self-esteem inside of us. You know, it's it's a point that is, is age-old. I'm doing a lot of reading in Spinoza, and it's really right at the center of his philosophical thought that we that we do not 
place our well-being into others that we, otherwise we're constantly at the at, uh, at subject to the vagaries of others and I, we fall up or down. Other therapists have used the the idea that our thermostat of, of well-being is too close to the window, uh, too close to the door, so that uh, outside events make us feel up or down, up or down, and we really want to center our, 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 own, our own self-esteem. Irving Allen's book is Staring at the Sun.